Hello, I am Rowan Conway. Um, I am from the UK, but I have some Canadian credentials in that I am fourth generation Prince Edward Islander. So, um, you know, those of you from Atlanta, Canada, you know, we're, we're there. Um, but I am currently working um, at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, as Gabe said, I lead the Mission Orientated Innovation Network, which is a group of at the currently 67 global public service agencies um, we, that from city level, from, um, from public banks and state-owned public banks, from innovation agencies and from federal government departments. So our role is to really understand how to do kind of public, put public purpose into innovation. And so what I'm going to talk about today is going to talk a little bit to the role of the public entrepreneur because they can't think effectively the, the, the binding tissue, if you like, uh, between all of these different government agencies and the reasons why they work with our institute is the desire to, to kind of form, if you like, an entrepreneurial state. Um, before I talk a little bit about IOPP, I just wanted to understand a little bit about you. How many of you are from the public sector? Oh, almost everybody. Okay. How many of you are from the private sector? Okay, a few. How many of you are um, Code for Canada fellows? Okay, good to know. Um, then I hopefully I will be speaking to, to, the, to the audience that is, is interested and actually feels the pain of public entrepreneurship. Um, just a little bit to, to build on what Gabe had said about um, IOPP. Um, it was founded in 2017 by Professor Mariana Masakatu, who is the author of The Entrepreneurial State. The idea is to really focus on public value and to really go through the kind of bust the myths, if you like, that the public sector is purely inertial or purely there for market fixing, but is actually one of the most important market shapers that there is. The new lens that Mariana has brought to, to the discourse, if you like, and she's perennially around the world talking to governments and, um, and um, presidents and people who are shaping, shaping economic policy around the world, is that the state has to be, as well as the corrector of failures, also take a new lens of recognizing its core role in the stimulator of innovation, as a stimulator of innovation, whether that, that be through fiscal policy, whether that be through um, how we spend our money. What, she, what she's really put forward is that innovation should have um, it do, should not just have a rate, it should not just be that we are trying to move fast, but uh, it should also have a direction, that we should be much more mission orientated in these times of complexity, in these times of climate change, in these times of really chunky issues like what does it mean to really take on and grasp challenges of decolonization. Now, this is a, a nice glib slide, and um, it's, it's, it, but it, it, it sort of shows the caricature, caricaturing of the private and the public sector. And Mariana has some very you know, long and deep um, analyses about the innovation chain, which I won't go into here, but fundamentally recognizing that ultimately the private sector often sits at the end of an innovation chain, at the commercialization space, um, but that it takes all of the credit for the dynamism of the market. Um, and that the public sector is always seen as a bureaucracy, that it's, it's a, it's, it's risk averse, that it doesn't like to actually enable innovation. Um, we work very hard at the, at the um, Institute to really go deep on that assumption. One, to bust the myths that actually government usually is the primary catalyst for innovation. So if you see, you know, currently lots of central banks are struggling with what do we do about monetary policy and fiscal policy in order to deal with the potential impacts of coronavirus. You know, actually this is when you work with state actors that they're actually taking some of the most important decisions about market shaping and in de indeed dealing with societal challenges. It's not just to correct market failures if an if a, if a, um, you know, airline goes out of business or what do we do to, to sort of roll in and bail out the banks if they need to, to be bailed out. So we, we challenge that assumption, but we also look at it through multiple lenses. So we look at it through economic policy. So I sit in the policy team, but we also look at it through capabilities. So a core part of the research and the work that I'm doing is really looking at what are the capabilities that we need in government and working with these different members of the network around the world to understand how do they approach um, innovation. So... These entrepreneurs, so I'm going to talk about public entrepreneurs, um, and I would say they are people like yourselves. You know, today, in today's program, there's going to, you're going to be looking at some tricky, tricky issues that need entrepreneurialism. Um, 
digital government and civic tech through cities. You know, that's a much more complex than it sounds. You know, the, the thinking about how you bring service design into government, thinking about how you create agile procurement. I spent three years analyzing procurement. I know that these things are incredibly challenging when you start actually trying to get into the grit of them. And then, you know, even more complex issues like what is a social safety net? Um, how many of you would consider yourselves design or digital practitioners? Okay. And when, so keep your hand up if you're a design. And then hands down if you design, keep your hand up if you, it, hands up if you see yourself as kind of digital first. Okay, so there's a lot of skill in this audience in terms of actually how you approach it. And so I, you know, one of the kind of dynamic capabilities that we look at in, in more detail is how you deploy digital agile behavior, uh, you know, agile methodologies, plus how do you look at things like user-centered design and how do they fit into government? Um, I keep using this as my clicker. That's not very <laughs> sensible. Um, now, the, the drive, if you like, the appetite for change, a lot of the time, or the demand that's happening in government, maybe the demand that sees the need for Code for Canada fellows is a, is a digitization demand. And you're seeing that at macro levels in governments around the world. They're like, oh, sugar, we need to get busy on this because really we're behind the curve. So digital certainly is driving a need for public entrepreneurs. And when I say public entrepreneurs, I, I largely mean people with these capabilities and with a thirst for change in government. Um, and as digital is rewriting the rules, you know, public sector institutions are recognizing they need to act in this agile way. So you've kind of got an open door. Um, there is a desire to deliver better government services digitally and empower communities to, to sort of take more control and solve challenges using technology and design. However, you know, having observed this for the last five years in my work, both at the IAPP, but also at the RSA, where I, I led the RSA lab looking into public service innovation, um, we recognize that actually really living like this beyond the pilot or beyond the lab um, the stakes are very high in public institutions because there are fundamental statutory responsibilities for tax and spend, for human lives, and that kind of statutory duty of care is something that actually sometimes really resists against digital um, and design methods. And hence why there's a real popularity, certainly in Europe, for design labs. You know, what I'm looking at now is how we use design tools to counter the caric caricature of the state as slow and bureaucratic and really move towards how people can move fast and fix things. Now, just to pause a moment on why, um, it's not just that there's a thirst for digitization, although that really is driving, that's opening the door for you. This is why people want you. This is why people want to work with you. Um, but there is, we are at a moment of transition between an, an era of new public management, an era where ultimately there was a cascade, where managerialism, institutionalism, where hard, hard um, structures were prevailed, um, where there was a kind of a specialization mindset, the idea that you could close doors um, and that you could have a, a hierarchy of, um, of communication. That's been driven, you know, a change in new power values is driven fundamentally generationally. Um, and it's not just that we have a sort of surge of digital natives coming on board, but that ultimately our society has moved to one of open source collaboration. Our society is moving to one that wants to debate difficult issues in public, one that wants radical transparency and wants to see itself as empowered and enabled in a kind of maker culture. I, this is a pretty good book if you want a, a relatively quick read on on this kind of where we are right now in the in the kind of change of cultural values from old power to new power and I think the kind of memorable moment from this is old power is seen as a currency it can be held and it can be controlled old new power is seen as a current it's ultimately it surges and it goes in waves and you have to work out how you roll with it being at this, at this intersection between old and new um, generational power paradigms is actually really interesting when you get into government because you end up with these kind of slightly, now these are, these are slightly stereotypical, but they are fundamentally, they, I see this a lot in the, in the interplay between people coming into government with digital mindsets and then hitting up against some of the resistance. This is not necessarily that one is good and one is bad. What this is saying is that these are the areas that we need to really look at to understand where our work is going to be most successful. If you think about a regulatory mindset, a regulatory mindset, and this is work that was done by Bearing Point, not by me, but I think it's very good, um, which ultimately, you know, risk aversion sits in a, in a space of regu where regulators are there. That's what they're there to do is to prevent problems or prevent harm. You know, security, risk, um, you know, how we cr create the enablement of kind of um, uh, structures that are private. 
are a go con counter to digital mindsets, which are much more around kind of laissez-faire, free economy, boundless communication, um, the idea of freedom of ideas. So these, there are drivers of change that digital, digital is a fundamental driver of change, but you still emerge into some of the challenges of how we have control mindsets sitting with regulators. Oh, hello. There's my regulator. So there's, a, there's my big brother going, get on with it. Okay, so um, the start of the research that I did was working when I was at the RSA with the um, UK Innovation Agency, um, Innovate UK, to really understand the problems that they had had in trying to drive design, user-centered design primarily, into their government innovation programs. We were working with innovation through government as opposed to innovation in government, and I think many of you will actually be looking at innovation in government, which is how do we tidy up our bureaucracies. But innovation through government is really how do we use procurement to enable innovation. Um, but we saw the same challenges across the board, um, both those people who were working in departments and trying to do things differently, and people who were trying to commission um, uh, innovation. So I wrote a couple of reports, and if you're interested in following them up, there's, this was the first one. It talks about you know, how you go from design thinking to really thinking about systems change. And then I followed it up with a second one, which was called Move Fast and Fix Things, which was really about how do you start prototyping new ways. But this is worth pausing on, because it was the substance of, of the first report which is that while they had done a lot to skill up um, people who were going through their accelerator programs on using user-centered design and human-centered design skills, and they were really working through their whole toolkit, they'd really um, improved design skills. Specifically, these were in, in kind of startups or GovTech pro processes that were going through an accelerator they were still finding that actually they were having a problem with scale. So they weren't having a problem with improvement. What they were having was actually how does it go out and, and change things on a broader level. So while this end of the, of the, the design thinking process was going really great, um, what they were finding was that they'd get to really good user and service design pilots. And then beyond the pilot, they were finding it incredibly hard to replicate or incredibly hard to scale. So we were brought in really to understand what does that look like? What are the things that are preventing this? And I'd say that there are kind of the above the line things and then there are the below the line things that are, mean that you hit the barrier to actually enabling change through the innovation or the, or the tools that you're using when you're trying to change things in government. Some of those are very easily seen above the line. They might be procurement rules, they might be um, regulatory frameworks. So we tried all sorts of interesting hacks, like how do you use pre-commercial com procurement? How do you change? How do you work with, with really small scale pilots to understand the difference? How do you think about agile procurement? But then there were things that really shocked us. And one of those things was actually consistently in all of the different agencies that we worked with, um, media backlash was something that really concerned them. I don't know if that's the case in Canada, but it was absolutely the case in UK agencies, that they were more scared of their, their agency going being a headline news for, for errors than they were really confident about doing this at scale. Very happy to work at a pilot. You can, but you can say a pilot is... Um, uh, you know, it's a pilot, but actually when you start saying, well, this is how we do things now, it's a bit more of a challenge. So you end up with this, what we ended up calling a system immune response. Things didn't actually scale. They went back to scale one. You'd done a nice pilot. There was lots of interesting prototypes around, but they didn't really get into the core. So in the, it, through that work, what we got to was this idea of the public entrepreneur and how you start thinking about entrepreneurial hacks that start hacking away at these different things. And we came up with this kind of concept of think like a system and act like an entrepreneur, which meant, brought in the concept that you have to think more systemically, not just about the user-centered design, not just focusing on your users, but understanding that wider context, both at the kind of institutional level, but also at the macro level. You know, what's happening in the macro environment? What's happening in, in society right now? So at a first st stage, a public entrepreneur is a bureaucracy hacker. And this is almost an, a, an essential gateway into being able to make change in government. Um, you can't actually make change in government unless you build the core skills that I think you're all probably incredibly proficient at. Um, it's someone highly skilled at navigating the existing bureaucracy. You know your space. You know the political networks. You've got enough clout to nudge changes. If you ever, if you know the government digital service in the UK, you'll know that Mike Bracken, you know, was the ultimate bureaucracy hacker. He kind of went, "Get out of my way, or I will kill you." But um, that was 
that was just his modus operandi. Other people did it in different ways. Um, you know, the guys at 18F were probably a little bit more, um, well, actually, I'm being very rude to Mike. He's a friend of mine, and he would be okay about that. Um, they, they saw themselves as kind of problem solvers. They want to be productively disruptive and curious. But I'm suggesting here that Bureaucracy hacks are an essential. They're an essential foundational way to make change in government, but they will not fundamentally change government. And you need to recognize this. If you're committed to this for your life and you don't want to be perennially banging your head against a, door, a brick wall going, oh my God, this is so painful. Why am I not making change? You have to recognize that hacks only go so far, that disruption only goes so far, that actually to go into the mainframe is a lifelong journey and it's a lifelong learning journey. This quote is actually from 20 years ago by James Wilson, but he, I think it rings incredibly true from all of the work that I've ever observed. He said, real innovations are those that alter core tasks, but most changes add to or alter peripheral tasks. Government agencies change all the time, but the most common changes are add-ons. New programs added on to existing tasks without changing the core tasks or, or, or altering the organizational culture. I'm not saying you want to go, actually, I'm only going to the core. But if you don't have a mission towards the core, you have to be able to think, why am I doing this? You know, so sometimes you can spend all of your life and it's, and it's really worthwhile work, you know, actually just taking the bureaucracy away from an agency. But if you want, you do need to be thinking, what's the ultimate mission for this agency? Am I on course to help enable that mission? So I guess what I'm asking you to reflect on for the rest of your day when you're going through all of this good work that's going, going on is to recognize that public entrepreneurs, which you already are, uh, target individual solutions, which are parts of more complex problems. I'm encouraging you to think possibly that you could be system entrepreneurs, where you can facilitate change to an entire ecosystem. And that requires that you understand complexity, you understand a little bit more about how a problem, you know, the problem, the deeper problem that you're working with, as opposed to the peripheral problem that you're working with. And I totally understand, having watched the kind of pitch sessions last night, that there is a lot of bureaucracy that you need to get through. So actually, you can have enormous sense of success from actually getting a lot of stuff done. You do need to also go deeper and understand why am I, what is this in service to? So tidying up a process, decluttering an online form is an essential task, but actually what is the end game for the service that you're working with? And that will require that you understand beyond just the user-centered design techniques or the digital, you know, how you work as an agile, uh, agile practitioner, it, understanding how this impacts other parts of a system. And this, I think, is about broadening your mind. Now, I think in your mind, my mind, anyone's mind, that's very, it sounds a bit, um, bit high, grandiose of me to say broadening your mind. Sorry about that. Um, but it's about thinking in a multi-layered way. So the learn adapt model always says, and I, I feel ridiculous saying this, but I'm going to say it, you know, get off the dance floor and go to the balcony. Ugh, I sounded ridiculous saying that. But the idea of not always being in the thick of your design process, but that you can stand back and you can see the bigger picture. So you can actually have that high level view. You know, user-centered design and digital processes often sit very deeply in the micro. They look at behaviors, they understand users, they are really working at a task level. That's essential that you do that well. But being able to step back and understand the meso level, which is the institutional level, does this institution even really need to be here? <laughs> Why are we doing this? You know, is a, is a really important, who do we interface with? If there's a sense of competition between in institutions, why? And should we just step out of the way? You know, doing it entirely at a task level or at an individual user level can sometimes validate you to feel like you are doing essential work in government because it is, uh, there's a lot of work. But actually getting outside, understanding the institutional context, also understanding the social movements around it and how you're part of that is a really interesting um, way of thinking thinking about the kind of challenges in institutional culture. And then at that kind of macro level, the systemic change, you know, if you're talking about decolonization, don't just box it into a task. That requires that you sit and you think deeply. It doesn't mean that you create an accelerator program for indigenous people to go through a process that's exactly like yours. And that's something you have to really reflect on. So when you're talking about how do we reflect on that, understanding the multiple layers of generational challenge that sits with decolonization is something you really need to go to. And I need to go to because I am fourth generation Prince Edward Islander. So how can systems entrepreneurs facilitate wider change? And I will try and end with this. 
the few insights and maybe from the work that I've seen, the work that I've observed and the research that I'm currently doing is understanding yourself as part of a context that, that you cannot control, that you are always going to be part of that and what is your space in that system and understanding how you push what moves. So this is my kind of very pithy way of helping understand the kind of journey from public entrepreneur into systems changes and recognizing that no one person is a systems changer. You know, Greta Thunberg's an incredible, you know, kind of person to changing the world, but she's not changing it on her own. She is working through a kind of social movement of change. So pushing what moves means understand where change is ready and taking the tools that you have to make that change happen. In the first instance, this is the public entrepreneur, the kind of stack of pebbles. See those as skimmers that you can pick up and you can do. You have the tools, you know how to work in digital, you know how to create a pilot, you know how to use user centered designs. Make those changes, do that work. It is all good. You have permission to do it, work, you know, just get going, do it. The bit in the middle is the bit that I would start saying is about how systems entrepreneurs start understanding that meso level, understanding that actually if we're going to work to do institutional transformation, if we're going to try and change against a particular mission, you know, we want to affect climate change or we want to deal with something, you know, like a pandemic maybe, um, you know, we have to work together in order to do that. And so therefore we have to understand who is our tribe in this. That means going outside of your pilot. And I know that pilots are always outward looking. They're always trying to understand how does a user, what a user needs. But this is actually about whole understanding of the systems and then working on long-term deeper relationships so that you can work on that change together. And importantly, it's also about understanding what doesn't move. So the kind of final, final piece about the kind of, you can't move a mountain. Now mountains might move eventually on their own, but that's because all of the kind of macro changes, they're going with that. So I will leave you with a kind of, if you like, a, a checklist of things that you might want to work on. This is the work I'm doing right now on dynamic capabilities in government. Recognizing that we have some really, really good digital and design methods um, that are enabling much better delivery that maybe are working a little bit more to an engineering mindset. So they can, they can be deductive and empirical, they're very evidence-based and it means that you get stuff done. That works really well for complicated pro projects like building a website, you know, like you know, the things that you're doing which are really tough work. There are places where you need to cultivate your artist, where you need to work on your sort of creative and generative work, um, internal skills. Um, that allows you to work a little bit more in this kind of responsive and ad adaptive way. It's much more open. Um, we need both, and I'm not criticizing either. I think that it's essential that we actually try and build, as systems practitioners or systems entrepreneurs, the ability to understand both of these. Um, so I will leave you with these, these final ideas. You already have nailed it as bureaucracy hackers, you just absolutely don't need me. I am suggesting that it's worth trying to strive to be a system entrepreneur. In the era that we live in, when we have extreme challenges arising, it's important that we don't just focus on the micro. So understanding what the wider system is in the context that you're working, and then pushing what moves and working together with, with people to help you push what doesn't move. Work with institutions, understand beyond your own pilot what, uh, which other institutions you work with, even if you don't like them. It's an important cultivated skill, you know. Sometimes you have the tyranny of the similar, where someone is, I've seen this, where the policy lab and then a, then a kind of innovation agency in the same country doing the same thing, but they hate each other. Think, That's really interesting. Why is that? Um, that often means that they've kind of got really good at the micro and they don't like people saying criticizing them. So really trying to, you know, break your own rules is an important thing for that. Anticipate immunity to change. Um, that's about understanding the macro environment, but fundamentally it's about understanding power with humility, not deference. Now, when I say humility, I mean, I've met so many public entrepreneurs along the way and many social entrepreneurs who, who will say something like, if government just got out of my way, I would totally solve this problem. There you go. <laughs> Bless you for thinking that, um, but that's not true. And actually the, the humility you need is to recognize why that's not true. And the curiosity you need is to recognize why that's not true. That's not the same as deference. If it is 
a problem with kind of broken power systems, you have to be that norm entrepreneur who challenges that. And that's why I think that the really interesting new power paradigm is important. You know, it's important to make it legitimate to say, you know, what your pronouns are. In many instances, people go, I just, I don't know. You know, I've never thought about my pronouns. Why should I think about my pronouns? But you, you, you ha have to be a kind of norm entrepreneur to do that. You have to take it out of your safe fail environment of your pilot or your lab where everyone talks about their pronouns and into wider environments where it's really uncomfortable. That's asking you to take that out there and have humility, not deference. And finally, System entrepreneurs, this is tough work, and this is why it's great to have a, a community or a collaborative collaboration. You will face perennial challenge, and it's lifelong perennial challenge, it never goes away, um, which is really, really difficult. And you can get what I've called in the past practitioner burnout, where you just think the whole of change is being leveled on me, and why is that? Form action learning sets, form bonds with people who are doing this in other institutions. They will become your growth friends for life. And so I say, be kind to yourself and find your tribe and maybe this is it. Thank you very much.